If something's intelligent, why would you have it do mundane, shitty work? Intelligent things don't want to do mundane, terrible work, um, which is your whole point about why you want humans to flourish and not have to do the mundane work. I think there's going to be another category of things here that are not without the I in it. It's just like agent, artificial agents. I think once you bring the word intelligence in, you actually have a problem. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's sort of overshooting what these things are going to be doing. So I think things that can assist artificial assistant agents, triple A's, whatever you want to call them, there will be those things. But I also find it to be really sad, frankly, if like computers are just scheduling all your time for you. Just now, simply looking at a board for how to spend your day because some bots determined how your day should be spent, that's not agency. That's losing all agency. Humans need to know how to, like, you have to be in charge of your time. Your time is the most valuable thing you have. The only thing that, that really, really ultimately matters in a lot of ways. And to say like, well, let something else just schedule my time. I don't think that's freedom. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Sick Podcast. Talk about business and AI. Um, my co-host, Joe Trinaski, is out buying another Hawaiian island. He's, it's, it's a habit. <laughs> he's got to get that under control. Right, Jason? He's like addicted to it. How many yeah. does he have? I, it's just like, he's at like 10 or something. Oh but gosh. like, he's a good bro. He's, he, he buys them. And then he gives them back to the Hawaiians and just say, just get me a Hawaiian shirt and we're cool. And Wow. You know, what yeah, a he's deal. A good, he's a good dude. Gosh, I wish I was a Hawaiian. I know, right? Jesus. Yeah. So he, uh, uh, so then also I uh, do m and uh, We're veteran Googlers. Um, if you all like takes on business and AI with comedy without hype, this is your show. Don't forget to like, subscribe. I am joined by Jason Freed and I was going to do an uh, introduction, but instead I have, this is top five business books. This is it. If you're a founder and you haven't read this before, you're screwing your employees and yourself. You need to read this. And so what I want to do is I want to read the intro because that's a good intro for Jason. So mm. we have something new to say. This is Jason wrote this. We have something new to say about building, running, and growing or not growing a business. This book is based on academic is book isn't based on academic theories. It's based on our experience. We've been in business for more than 10 years along the way. We've seen two recessions, one bubble burst. He's now been in business longer than that. Uh, business model shifts and doom and gloom predictions come and go, and we've remained profitable through it all. We're an intentionally small company that makes software to help small companies and groups get things done the easy way. More than 3 million people around the world use our products, much more now. Um, we started out in 1999 as a three-person web design consulting firm. In 2004, we weren't happy with the project management software used by the rest of the industry, so we created our own, Basecamp. When we showed the online tool to clients and colleagues, they all said the same thing. We need this for our business tool. Five years later, Basecamp generates millions of dollars a year in profits. Um, we now sell other online tools, high rise, our contact management and simple CRM tool it's used by tens of thousands of small businesses to keep track of leads, deals, and more than 10 million contacts. More than 500,000 people have signed up for Backpack, our internet and knowledge sharing tool, and people have sent more than 100 million messages using Campfire, our real-time business chat tool. We also invented an open source and computer programming framework called Ruby on Rails that powers much of the web, web 2.0 world. Side note, there's a real estate website, website called biggerpockets.com. My friend started it. He built his whole business on Ruby on Rails and then sold it for $7 million. Big fan of your work too. So thank you for everything you're doing. Um, some people consider us an internet company, but that makes us cringe. Internet companies are known for hiring compulsively, spending wildly, and failing spectacularly. That's not us. We're small, frugal, and profitable. A lot of people say we can't do what we do. They call us a fluke. They advise others to ignore advice. Some have even called us irresponsible, reckless, and gasp unprofessionals. The critics don't understand how a company can reject growth, meetings, budgets, board of directors, advertising sale people, and the real world, yet thrive. That's their problem, not ours. They say you need to sell to the Fortune 500. Screw that. We sell to the Fortune 5, uh, 500, 5 million. There's more of this, but I, I want you all to buy a copy of his book. <laughs> it's so good. So that's my introduction for you, Jason. Welcome to the show. Thank you good for to be joining here. us. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're, we're super pumped to have you here. Um, I to, to start, like, gosh... Um, let's talk about kind of side note. Um, mm -hmm. it seems like you got involved in businesses early. You mm. probably had, you were working as a teen and whatnot. Maybe we can talk about that and how it has influenced your thinking. Yeah. I remember, uh, <clears throat> well, let's see. Um, my dad was an entrepreneur kind of, he worked for someone else for a while and kind of hated it and ended up going off on his own. And that kind of inspired me a little bit. My grandfather was an entrepreneur. He started a big grocery store, grocery store chain in in the midwest in the u.s um so i don't maybe it's in my blood maybe it's in there somewhere i'm not really sure um 
But uh, I've always enjoyed working. I, you know, got a worker's permit at 13 the day I could get one. My dad took me down and uh, got one and I got a job at the local grocery store and been working ever since. I just enjoy being productive. I enjoy making things. I enjoy doing stuff. I don't know. I have a hard time sitting still, let's say. Um, but yeah, I, I dabbled a lot with um, little entrepreneurial exploits. I used to sell like car stereos to my friends and I would sell like way back in the day, cordless phones before there were cell phones, cordless phones and radar detectors and all sorts of stuff. I just like to sell things. I like to buy stuff. I like to sell stuff. I like to make catalogs of things. Uh, and I would just kind of, you know, photocopy them and pass them out and get some orders and fulfill them. It was super fun. So that kind of got me going, I think, in, in the first place. I mean, uh, there's a lot more to it, but that's sort of, I got the taste early. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. And you, it, based upon your grandpa's experience, what you heard in the family, being a small business owner, and then what you were doing, you also knew about like, to run a business, you need profit. You can't just hope yeah. for money to come in and whatnot. So can you talk about like how y'all do things differently here at uh, 37 Signals? Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, part of it is probably growing up in the Midwest. There's just a real practicality. And then seeing my grandparents and, and then my dad, my, my mom worked as a real estate agent. So she was sort of on her own, but worked in a real estate office. You just like, things have to work. Like you, you can't... <laughs> No one's like making money on volume in those businesses. You've got to make the businesses work. You know, they've got to make more money than they spend. You got to keep your costs in check. You got to keep your staff low. You don't spend a lot of money on things you don't need. Like this is just deeply ingrained in me from the beginning. So for us, it's, it's similar in that <clears throat> we've never hired somebody we couldn't afford to hire. You know, we didn't hire in anticipation of needing people. We would hire people only after it already hurt that we didn't have them and we could afford them. So you've got to be able to afford them. So you know, we've been profitable every year for, we've been in business now for 25 years and we've been profitable every year. And that's just, that's kind of the only metric we look at at all. Like, are we making more money than we spend? All the other details work themselves out. If this product's more profitable than that product, I don't really care. As long as overall the business is making more money than it spends. If this endeavor is more profitable than this, I don't, I don't care. I don't micromanage the numbers there. It's like the whole thing has to work out. And I don't really care what works better than other things and what doesn't work as well as it's just like, how do we feel about it? Do we, are we enjoying the work we're doing? Are we making more money than we spend? Then we're happy. That's, that's it. So I'm not after maximization. I'm not after trying to squeeze every last penny out of anything that's possible. I'm okay with leaving money on the table as long as we still have more than we need. Um, but yeah, the core to that, by the way, is keeping the company as small as we possibly can. So um, we have a lot of customers, a lot of paying customers, over 100,000 paying customers. But uh, we have 72 people right now, um, and we've you know we, we've we've been as high as 80. We've most of our time was spent under 40. Um, we're kind of in our sweet spot right now, and uh, you know we could have three or four or five times that the companies we compete with have thousands of people. We don't need them. They they wouldn't they we, they'd make us worse if we had more people. So we're very comfortable keeping things tight. That's such a good point. It would make us worse if we had more people. More people and more money. Like if we, if someone came up to me and said, here's 20 million, like I would go, I don't know what to do with this. I would fuck it up. I would definitely ruin the business. I, I, I would. Um, and the same thing would be true. Here's another hundred engineers go. Like, I don't want them. I don't need them. Um, we've got our team. We work our own way. We're very small. We're very efficient. We're very tight. We know each other's first names, like all that stuff really matters to us. And, uh, that's, I think, how we're capable of doing, I mean, there's more to it, but that's at the core, that is key. Because if we had three or four times as many people, I don't think we could do things the way we do them today. Such a good point. And also, you said you know your employees' names. So they're not just numbers on Excel spreadsheet. Like, um, so many of my good friends who used to work at Google, well, one, one friend in particular, oh, he literally saved HR so many times at Google from all the mistakes we made and whatnot, saved acquisitions. And then he was just a number on a spreadsheet and they let go of him and they, they laid him off. And that was a dagger to everyone who, who knew about him. And I reflect upon when my dad ran small businesses that he knew all his employees. And he told me one time in the seventies, when they went down into a recession, he basically took money out of his salary and everything, reduced everything. And then figured out who were family people who had kids and whatnot, try to keep their hours going. And for the younger kids, he tried to cut them down onto, um, you know, part time, even though he's losing money. And I asked him like, you know, that's really nice of you. Like, what'd you do it? And it's like, mm -hmm. it's hard when you look someone in the eyes every day 
and say, no, you're not going to take care of them. So go ahead. Yeah, no, I, it's a great story. And it, it, it reminds me of a story I heard, a very similar story. I was at this like CEO round table kind of thing and people are going around. And the question was, how many employees do you have? And um, I forget her name, but the CEO is sitting next to me and, and she said, I don't, I don't have employees. I have mortgages. She goes, everyone who works for me, they have a house, they have a family, they have kids. I feel responsible for 38 mortgages is how she, which sounds like similar to your father's. Like these are people with lives and they depend on you and you depend on them. And I don't, for what it's worth, I don't believe businesses are families. And I think that like mixing the, even the idea is, is dangerous. I don't think it's a good idea, but, uh, there's obviously you have to see the humanity in, in people you work with. And these are humans who are struggling and they've got things going on. So if, yeah, if you, if you can do that sort of thing, it's wonderful. And I'm glad your dad is that kind of stand up person to do that. That's just a great story. It's inspiring. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. No, I, and your work's inspiring. I was telling people off camera, like this conversation means so much to me because I used, I was reading your book when I was working in such a large organization and I was seeing all these companies getting funded and some were acquiring. And I was like, this doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Like this company's not profitable. You're wasting talent or whatnot. Like, am I crazy? Does this make sense? And so <laughs> when you were writing this in 2010, we're in the depths of recession. And then eventually the Fed Burr, Fed go Burr, money became free. And so we were seeing crazy things such as scooter companies getting funded. Yeah. We, speaking of crap tech companies, we have this one video called Dead Tech Companies Walking, who will be crushed by ChatGPT. Uh, plus, we also have videos of challenges of AI agents. And for the people of kink, we have the adult entertainment industry meets AI. No, you're not going to see Joe naked in that video. Well, actually, you could possibly see me or Joe naked in that video. That can only happen if you go to patreon.com forward slash SVIC and give us $5. Then you'll see if maybe one of us are, is naked. And also, you get access to our reading list. Like, I crack the whip on Joe and regular basis i'm like update this shit god damn it he's like okay i'm just busy buying more hawaiian islands but he gets his best research papers i'm talking straight bangers that he puts in here and then we summarize it so you get to actually not have to read the whole paper you get a gpt4 summary and then decide if you want to read it or not but we have like hundreds of papers here binders full of papers here no we're not talking like Mitt Romney shit. We don't talk that way about women. Stop being weird like that. But anyways, um, patreon.com forward slash SVIC. That's patreon.com forward slash SVIC. And for five bucks a month, you get access to all of our fantastic episodes. We, we put a new one out every week, like straight fire. So patreon.com forward slash SVIC. Thank you. And I was like, for a while, I was like, maybe I'm just going crazy. I'm missing something. And then the interest rates went up and then all these companies imploded. So I'm wondering... Um, did you ever feel tension of how you were operating and then seeing some of your peers getting all this money and doing like wonky things? And you're thinking, hmm, maybe I, is there something we're doing wrong here? Are they, or, or, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I know the feeling. I mean, you, you can get to that place where you're like, God, are we just wrong? Like, are we, you know, and then that's when you slip and that's when you fall off of your, your foundation. And that's when it's dangerous because now you're not moored to anything and you just start to follow the, 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 the current and, at some point it washes out to the ocean, which is what's happening right now. You know, unfortunately I laugh. It's not funny. People are losing their jobs. Businesses are going under, but when money is cheap and free, which it basically was for a handful of years there, like incredibly low interest rates, close to zero. <clears throat> um, and, and money was just being poured out into anybody's, well, not anybody, but most anybody's hands. Um, you know, it's, everything seems great when you got other people's money in the bank. Uh, and you don't have to make the business work because you've got what's making the business work is someone else's money. That's not your customer's money. But at some point that dries up and you're seeing that now. And then what ends up happening is people struggle and they, they don't have the skills. This is the problem. When you spend other people's money, and I don't mean customers, I mean like investors money. Um, you don't ever have to develop the skills of making your own. And if you don't have the skills to make your own, when it's time to make your own, you're not going to be any good at it. Just as if someone threw you up on stage with a guitar, you've never played guitar before, and says, hey, go play. You're going to suck. Everyone would know that that would be the case. So why is it that we think, well, we can just turn the revenue or the profit you know, handle on when it's time? Like we're going to learn how to blow money and be totally unprofitable, and totally sloppy. But then once we don't have to be, we won't be. No, come on. It doesn't work that way. Right? So... I think the, the benefit of always being sane around this is that you're practicing and you're getting better and better and better at making money, which is the fundamental skill in business, obviously, if you want to keep your business around. 
but yeah, th- there's, there's like these fleeting moments where you're like, man, you know, like, it, wouldn't it be nice if, but then, then sense comes back and, and it comes rushing in and you realize, no, it wouldn't. Again, I wouldn't know what to do with 20 million or 100 million or whatever people might give us. I wouldn't know what to do with another 100 or 500 employees. I wouldn't know. Now, that might be my own shortcoming, totally fair, but that's fine. It's not the kind of business I want to run, not, not the kind of organization I want to run. So um, anyway, I, I don't let those fantasies get the best of me. I mean, for a moment, you can think something. And we actually, you know, I should be honest, a couple of years ago, we actually started talk, talking about like, should we go public? Should we go public? Wouldn't it be interesting to go public as a profitable tech company? Wouldn't that be amazing? Like we're almost out there to prove a point. Like you can actually be a profitable tech company. And then we just, it's like, we, we're like all into it. And then we realize, like, you know what? Going public is a massive pain in the ass and a huge distraction. And I don't want that kind of scrutiny. It's just not interesting to us. So we kind of moved on and, and changed our minds. But we did have that feeling for just a minute. Jason, I really want to see you doing Q1 calls with some coke addicted Wall Street investor <laughs> asking you about like, what's your CAC and LTV? And I know it's oh your I don't know what that guy. means. What? <laughs> I mean, I know what those mean, but I don't know what many of the acronyms mean. I mean, yeah, I, I, that would be that would actually be horror. That'd be hell for me, absolute hell. Uh, it's just so not interesting. So anyway, we, but we did we did harbor that fantasy for, I mean, a few at least a few months, um, and then 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 we're like, no, no, sanity came back. So it's kind of like Odysseus when you heard the sirens. You know, you hear. I want to hear the sirens would tie me to the mast of the ship. Yes, but don't don't let me go. No, right. Um, so you heard the siren call. But what brought you back? Like, what was like, oh, wait a minute. No, it's not a good idea. We're we're realizing that we were starting to do things internally that were in anticipation of pointing in a certain direction. And we realized, I don't actually want to go in that direction. What was it? It's like these headwinds, like more record, like we're like practicing. Like, well, we have to keep all these extra records and change the way we do our books in a certain way. And we're probably going to need to hire some more people to deal with, uh, uh, you know, all these other regulations and, and rules and, and, and um, requirements around, you know, all, all the things, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley, so all the stuff like we have to get a lawyer's like, like, wait a second, wait, wait, why are we doing this? How is this helping our products? How is this helping our customers? It's not, it's going in the opposite direction. And we start playing that out some more and be like, you know what, all these things we're going to have to do, like we hate when we even have to deal with anything legal. It's just such a pain in the ass, like any little, like a trademark thing or, or a patent troll or whatever. And you think about like multiply that by a hundred to, to go public, like not interested, just not. So, so we ran into a few of these things. We're like, you know what? Like this, this, we just played it out. And like, this is going to suck. Let's not do that. Why are we doing it anyway? Again, it was like, was this an ego thing where we trying to prove something? What was this? And then it comes back to always like, does it help our products? Does it help our customers? Does it help us? Actually, none of those three things were true. So let's not do that. So we got, you know turn around and again, return to sanity. Beautiful. It, yeah. it happens to all of us. And um, <laughs> I also think too, just when I was at Google, it was always, what's our quarterly report? Oh, stock's going up. And so everyone's happy. And then, oh, some crank is like, no, stock's terrible. Even though we're making more money than God. And then Sundar has to answer TGIF questions. The stock price went down 5%. What's going on? So there's all this distraction that happens. You can't focus on long-term planning anymore. You know? That was actually another thing that came up. Was just thinking about like because we were we were having these thoughts, <clears throat> and then the market started tanking, and a lot of uh, companies in our industry and in, in our you know our close industry were like had lost eighty percent. And I'm like, I'm just thinking like, what if that was us? You know, and now all of a sudden we put this massive stress on everybody for no reason whatsoever. Like everyone is stressed out of their minds now. That what they thought they had is worth you know ten percent of what it was. Like, think about what kind of pressure that puts on people. Again, does this benefit our customers, our product, and ourselves? No, it does not. It does not. So, again, you can get lost in these fantasies very quickly, um, especially when you're steeped in them. But it's very important to pull yourself out of that and go, wait, why are we doing this? Wait, why are we doing this? Why do we do any of these things? What are we doing here? Uh, It's a very good question to keep asking yourself because you can get pretty carried away and momentum will take you pretty far before you start asking those questions. And the further away you are, if you can't see the shore anymore, to keep playing out this maritime uh, <laughs> thing, like you're, you're in real trouble at some point. You're in real trouble. You're lost and you don't know where to go. And that's, I see that happen to a lot of entrepreneurs who initially had control of things. I don't mean control like they were, you know, uh, you know, ego kind of style control, but like 
they had things under control. The business was doing well. They had the right number of people. They, they were focused on the right things. And then they just got lost. They lost sight of themselves and what they were here for. And they started chasing something else that usually has dollar signs in front of it. And once that catches you, those are, you know, there's two hooks on a dollar sign. They just like, they grab you. Oh, I never, <laughs> two hooks. Of, okay. That's, I just thought of that a, right now. So no, I no, that, I'm, I'm you like, thought, you thought about it here on Svick. Don't forget to like, and subscribe. That's a YouTube short right there. Right, there no, we go. I, just drop a knowledge bomb. And this yeah. is why there's so many different directions I can go in this conversation right now. Let's start with your, I, I have in front of me right now. I just take a picture of this. I have all of your, most of your blog, well, last three or four months blog posts out here. Okay. You said, one of the reasons companies have a hard time moving forward is because they're tangled themselves in your past. Eyes aim backwards rather than ahead, st staring at the dark, feet in their own concrete. And I was thinking about how you were getting mangled in this conversation regarding going public or not. But yep. maybe you can talk about just when organizations get older, they have like this institutional memory or scar tissue or drama that prevents them from looking forward. Why don't you go? Yeah, I mean, I think that post, I'm trying to remember, that one was more about, um, I think, retrospectives, I think was what that one was about. Which, which a lot of, as companies get bigger, they, they start studying their pasts more. And, and every decision they make, they have to justify. And if things don't go right, they just wallow in it and try to figure out what went wrong. And they spend a lot of time and a lot of energy pointed backwards, trying to prevent things from happening again that, that went wrong. I, I, I'm not a fan of that. I, I, I think like you should have a sense, a, a gut sense of maybe what went wrong. But to spend a lot of energy and effort to try to figure out what you think it was and maybe what it was and maybe what it wasn't, I'd rather just do it again or do something else again and try to make more progress moving forward. So small companies, for they just don't have even the, the, the people. They, don't have, they, don't, they can't dedicate four people to look backwards and study something. They, they have to be making things. So that's the other thing about staying small is you don't have extra people, extra departments, extra groups that are there that can do things other than doing the work. I think it's important to have just people here who can do the work and to put them on something looking backwards when you realize like I would rather have them pointing forwards. Like if, if you realize that, then you're in a good spot. If you feel like you can afford to just have people pointing backwards, I think you're in a bad spot, frankly. So now I know some people go, well, you, what about learning from your mistakes? So you don't do things again yet. Yeah, there's some value in that, but I actually think it's quite overrated. I don't think there's a lot of value in it because I don't think you actually often really, really, really understand what maybe went wrong. And even if you do, that was within a specific context, a specific period of time, in a specific moment, in a specific situation. Is that exact thing going to happen again? Unlikely. And so you can study and get, it, we'll never make that mistake again, but then you're going to make a different one. So like, you're not eliminating all future mistakes by getting rid of one out of a thousand you can make. So now you have 999 you can make instead of a thousand, like, great. Good for you. Just keep make, keep going forward. Keep trying new things, keep making progress and learn as you go, learn pointing forward, not learn, learning, trying to look backwards. That's my, that's my point of view on it. At least that's what that, I think that post was about. Such a good point because then also you can over calibrate on what you thought, what the issue was. Um, yeah. I went to Santa Clara university and we had a professor who was in foreign services and he, he said, everyone tell me what was the reason why I went into the Iraq war. And everyone listed their one reason saying, this is it. And he's like, well, I was in the foreign services. We were thinking about all of those issues together and it kind of just happened, but you couldn't say at the time, which piece of the pie was the real reason why we did it. Yeah. And when you go back, you form historicism and you create a narrative and then you might overcorrect. Um, so I really, I really appreciate you bringing that up because I think it's a really important lesson for people to understand. Um, you also bring up another issue saying it's called enough feedback. Enough feedback comes quick. Invite a hundred, get 10, five, probably tell you what you need to know, or at least 80% of it, which is all you need to know. Now I read that. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, but I was trying to launch a project at Salesforce. So we're trying to do this new HR AI bot that was for 70,000 employees. And we had a competing project led by someone else at 50 employees. And I said, no, we need six. And so we did six. And then we went to UAT testing. They're like, well, we need to like UAT test like 20,000 people. I'm like, no, I think we'll be good with like 15, 20, because they're going to tell us the 80, 20. And then yeah. the rest we're going to figure out once we ship. And so we eventually ship and it worked out really well. But Great. I love your thoughts on on that and thank you for sharing that lesson. So can you talk a little more about feedback? Yeah, I, I think, uh, well, <laughs> um, first of all, my, my general point of view on feedback is that it's only valuable when it's real and it's only real when it's actually in the market as a real product. Now that means that you've got to figure shit out on your own. Um, and 
develop your gut instinct and develop your product sense to put something out there that you're proud of and you think is good. Then people can use it for real in their own environment, on their own time, to do their own work. That's the feedback that actually matters. To me, like showing someone, this is my take again, showing someone like half a product or a piece of a product and saying, what do you think of the, what, what do you think? It's like, I don't have anything to think, but you're asking me, so I'll tell you something, but like, this isn't how I'm going to use the thing. And this is only one piece of it, not all of it. And I don't even know how I would fit this into my life because I don't see the rest of it. And, you know, I, I just think there's a lot of false uh, feedback coming in. And I think that companies feel like they can't move forward unless like they put things in front of their customers ahead of time. Um, now, user testing might be a little bit different, but still, still, I got to say, I think you're better off just making the thing and putting V1 out there and then iterating from there. And if you're way, 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 way off base, you're fucked to begin with. I don't care what kind of, like, if you're that far off and it's that bad and broken and whatever, then, then you just, you, you have no business making that product to begin with. So you should be able to, like, get pretty close. You may have missed a few things or maybe some critical things you got wrong. Okay. But you should be really close because if you're not, you probably shouldn't be making the thing in the first place. And so at that point, though, the feedback you get is real. You don't need that much of it. And it's going to come in when it comes in. And pretty quickly, if there's some serious things, like a few people are going to spot the same thing. As, this is actually a problem. Now I know this is a problem or, um, or what. But like the other thing I think is important is, especially when something's brand new, like really a new idea, you've got to be careful not to take knee-jerk reactions, knee-jerk feedback. So if something's very different, challenging the norms, challenging the way people typically do things, their, their reactions are not necessarily about the product. They're about their own experiences prior to using the product. And if you want to make something new and you're, you're going to react to people's closely held historical expectations, it's going to be very hard to make something new if you start to change it back to the way it was based on what they wanted. You're not going to make new things that way. So I think that feedback's great to get in after it launches, but you can also sit on it for a while. Sit on it for 90 days and see if the same kind of feedback comes in 90 days hence. And it probably won't. Because it'll initially be this knee jerk and then people go, oh, actually, there's actually an idea here. This is actually pretty good. I'm getting more used to this now. Now this thing I thought was a problem isn't as much of a problem. So I think that's why you got to wait a little bit. Wait on it. Hold on to it. Think about it. Wait on it and see how the trends change. Let it cook. Uh, yeah, let I, it cook. I, yeah. I, such a good point because that's the product manager's dilemma. It's like you might have a novel technology. It's fantastic and good for the customer, but their expectations are so radical or, or just so different that it just doesn't can't make sense. And one thing it reminds me of is everyone always will talk about the failure of Webvan and how they failed and whatnot. Okay. And I think about like what – now everyone's buying all their groceries off of Amazon. Like they had the right idea. Yep. It was just that they were super duper early to it. And we can go into capital structure, but you know, that makes sense. We were too. Yeah. Totally. I mean, like, I think Campfire is a great example. Campfire is a product we had. We launched back in 2006 or seven uh, as a group chat tool. Eight years or so. I don't know what it was before Slack came out. And I remember having to shove Campfire down people's throats. They did not understand this idea of a persistent company-wide group chat. They just could not fathom what it was for. It, it just didn't, like, why would we use this, right? And we were just way, way, way too early. You now, Slack was a better product, but the fundamental nut of it was the same. And it they, people just were not ready for that yet. Just like Webvan, like, it's delivered. Great. Well, now, like, Postmates and Toast, and, I mean, well, Toast is not a delivery service, but Postmates and uh, Grubhub and whatever, I don't even know all of them now, um, whatever they are, DoorDash. And then just Whole Foods and other local grocery stores, like everyone's delivering now. So yeah, it is sometimes it's a matter of timing and it doesn't matter how good it is. Timing and luck are the top two things that play into anything, in my opinion, anyway. You got to be at the right place at the right time, which you typically don't, you're not able to create. Uh, and then you got to ride it. Like Basecamp came out in 2004, right time, very, very early. SaaS was brand new. We were one of the first SaaS tools. If we launched Basecamp today, we would struggle. The product is excellent, but we would struggle to gain traction. It's just harder to launch today in, into a crowded field. Back then, there was no crowd at all. Uh, or the crowd, everyone was like 80 years old, basically. All the tools were old and, and like from 20 years prior, right? So you, it's not like we waited, though. Oh, here's the opportunity. Now let's make this. It's like just we just made the thing and happened to be at the right place at the right time. And the market was ready for it and, and curious about it. So that's a big part of it as well. 
That's a really good point too, and it applies to careers also. That's why I hate when you get an executive and some a moderator is like, "So, uh, how can you be successful in your career? It's like work really hard, yeah. do good work, and always be available." It's like I know a lot of people have been laid off right now or went nowhere with their career, and they did all that. Yes. Let's talk about being at the right place at the right time at a rocket ship. Um, I have a friend right now who's getting a sweetheart deal from OpenAI, and I'm like, "Why are you not accepting this right now?" Cool. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, sometimes, like you said, like when you join these companies earlier, or you can say it specifically, but when you're new to an idea and you join something earlier, if it does work out, the spoils of war go to you. There's much, far less competition. And yeah. so in the early 2000s, it was like when enterprise, well, I don't even know if it was the concept of enterprise software or whatnot, they weren't thinking that much of the end user experience like Slack was thinking about, right? It was like, yes. your finance team buys it, you put up with it. It's like, well, this is making my eyes bleed. Sorry. <laughs> don't, it doesn't matter. That's how software was. And that was one of the reasons why Basecamp really took off in the early days. And all of our products did initially was, um, except Campfire didn't really do quite so well, like I said, but was that there was this focus on, um, well, actually people can use this and want to use this and it's actually easy to use and there's no training required and it doesn't feel like someone's shoving this down my throat. And it was just a totally different era of software that was beginning at that point. Um, and it, it was it was quite a bit more exciting, I would say, than... than um, than today's today's industry or today's the place in the in the field today. Of course, AI is super interesting. There's a lot of really interesting new stuff going on, um, but I think a lot of categories are pretty tired right now, actually, and are waiting for some something new to happen. Uh, it, it, love to hear more about that, and also love to hear more about your thoughts on AI in general. Well, I mean, AI is in, it's incredible. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, I'm. I'm I'm as curious and as wide-eyed and, and awestruck as pretty much everybody in terms of of, uh, of of what it can do and how it will be used. I think it's so frankly, I think it's so so early though that um, I, I'm just sitting back and, and meeting it with curiosity at this point. Like I'm playing around with some things, but we're not building it into our products yet. Uh, we're not we're not integrating any of the the you know APIs. Let's say so. Of course, we're not like inventing. Like everyone's like we have AI. Well, it's not really yours. It's probably open AI. Anyway, whatever it is. We haven't, we haven't begun to really play with, we played with it a little bit in Hey, our email tool internally, just kind of mess with it a little bit. But um, I, I think uh, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be very interesting to see where this all goes. I find the generative stuff, especially art, very interesting, incredibly interesting um, in, in many ways, kind of more interesting or more surprising. Um, so I'm, I'm fascinated by it and, I, and I'm paying very close attention to it. And I have a, I have a nine-year-old and a five-year-old. My nine-year-old's totally into it and is fascinated by it and it's, Really interesting, and you can just imagine what his world's going to look like compared to ours. Um, I do have like some bigger existential concerns and questions about about it, like really, like at that at that big big picture. But um, at the local software picture, I think it's going to be very helpful for a lot of things. That said, I, I will say this: right now, it feels a little bit more like a parlor trick. Right now, in business software, primarily, I think it's actually probably the most handy in things like customer service tools for sure. But I think like this idea of like summarizing long documents or like writing emails for you, I, I got to say like, if, 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 if I'm writing, if, if AI is writing email for me and the recipient is, has AI receiving emails and writing email, like what's the point of any of this? Like who's talking to who here? What is actually happening? And is this really the place where we're just like so struggling that we can't uh, communicate with each other? That is a little weird to me. And this idea of like summarizing long things and feeling like you've got it all, like th this idea that like, first of all, that would just signal to me that like there's too much writing going on in long form. Like long form is good, but it doesn't need to be like 40 pages. Like make something a page and a half. Like people should be able to read that too. So I, that part of it is like, wow, it can do that. So we're going to bring it to our product so we can show people that it can do that. And it's kind of impressive. But I think the really impressive thing that I've seen so far is the sort of the high hit rates on on delivering really quite good customer service. Uh, we actually just began to explore it with um, with Hey, specifically in, in the Hey Help tool. We use Help Scout and they just launched, or they're launching something around this to answer questions. And it's quite good. I've been very impressed. So I, that's, that's a great practical application for it in a way that feels like it's actually gonna save labor more so than like summarize this long document for me. I don't know, I, I just don't find that to be very useful. Exactly. I think it was really tough about reading your books, but then working into large conglomerates, I would see so much time when a message would start, if it was a direct 
me to a colleague, the message would be like one or two sentences. Yeah. And it goes to your manager and now it goes to a paragraph. <laughs> it goes to your VP. Now it's like two paragraphs. It goes to your SVP. You're looking like a page and a half. Oof. And so you'll see us expanding. And then the SVP now will probably get AI and be like, can you summarize this? Yeah. And they get an answer and then re-expand it and send it back down to the troops. So there's so much like work theater. Ugh. And I, and uh, I want to go into once, and I also want to show your products because I think you make wonderful products. Um, what I want to talk about is just, do you feel that, let's say that this AI starts taking off in some form, uh, my view is what's going to happen is we're going to have many more smaller firms where people can have not relationships I'll ever uh, replace family, that's the most important relationship and friends, but smaller organizations where people feel they're more human and have more agency. That's kind of like my utopian view of, of what, what I think could possibly happen. So you I, think you think humans will have more? You mean because they won't have to do mundane work? Is that what you mean? Yeah, I think a lot of the crap work is going to be taken over yeah. by these uh, these AI agents. Like, there's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs of like just like schedule meetings, yeah, yeah, take, take care of these te checklists or whatnot, yes. project check ins, and then there's this area where it needs human insight to get stuff done. So that's kind of like my view, but I can way off. Let me hear what you think. No, I, I think I, I I could see that happening. One one of the things that's interesting though is that. I don't know if you. Can, I don't know if it's good to be disconnected from the foundations of things. So, so if if you have all these agents running around and doing all this busy work for you, and you never see it except maybe it shows up in your calendar, I kind of wonder like, is it worth doing at all? Like, so so there's a lot of busy work being done, but if like, I I don't know. I kind of wonder about that. Like, and, and the other thing I, I'm really curious about is like. Of course, it's not really AI in that sense, because if something's intelligent, why would you have it do mundane, shitty work? Isn't that like what intelligent things don't want to do mundane, terrible work, um, which is your whole point about why you want humans to flourish and not have to do the mundane work. So I, I think there's going to be another category of things here that are not uh, with, without the I in it. <laughs> it's just like agent, artificial agents. I think once you bring the word intelligence in, you actually have a problem. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's sort of overshooting what these things are going to be doing. So I think things that can assist artificial assistant agents, AAAs, whatever you want to call them. Uh, let, I don't know, making that up. Who knows? It means anything. But I think that there will be those things. But I also find it to be really sad, frankly, if like computers are just scheduling all your time for you and you're just, you're just now simply looking at a board for how to spend your day because some bots just determined how your day should be spent. That's not agency. That's losing all agency. Um, humans need to know how to think. Like, you have to be in charge of your time. Your time is the most valuable thing you have. The only thing that, that really, really ultimately matters in a lot of ways. And to say like, well, let something else just schedule my time. I don't think that's freedom. So that's my more philosophical take. No, on that, that's a really good take. I think yeah. it's structurally in these large organizations. It's like, oh, we can have the AI come in, but it's still helping, still uh, allocating humans time. And we should more think of like, why are these organizations so large in the first place where everyone needs to be in the day with all these meetings? Maybe yeah. we should focus on that vector first, and then that will take care of all the other logistical stuff. Maybe. So, I think, though, what we will see which I think you also sort of mentioned was like, I think we're going to see a lot more powerful, smaller companies, which is wonderful. Companies that don't need as many people um, that are able to, to punch above their weight. This is a good thing. And I think that uh, it's not because though that like the mundane work will be taken care of by assistants or whatever, assistant bots, whatever you want to call them. I just think like they're going to, if you have a smaller company of six people, you don't have as much mundane work. Like, the, the scale, the size of the company squeezes out the stuff you don't need to begin with. And so now you don't need bots organizing your time. You just have six people and you can talk to one another. And you go, hey, this is how we do it. First of all, like at 37 times, we don't have shared calendars. I can't see anyone else's calendar. No one can see mine. They can't put something on mine. I can't put something on theirs. Okay. If you want to talk to me at three o'clock, you send me a, a note in base game. Say, are you free? Three? I, I, you got a half hour? When are you, when are you available? Now you might say that's really inefficient. I should be able to see my calendar so I can decide when you have the, I don't, I want, if you want to take my time or I want to take yours, it should be a conversation. It should be hard to take somebody's time. You should have to make a pitch. You should have to talk to someone. 
and you can work it out. And with six people, it's much easier to work it out. You don't need sophisticated calendaring systems and time blocks and little agents running around trying to fit things in like Tetris. You don't need any of that stuff. So that's what I think is going to be more beautiful about smaller companies moving forward. They'll have more power and you won't need as many people. And it's just going to squeeze out all the shit that people don't want to do in the first place. Well said. I think what you're doing is you're creating friction for things that are make work. And if you have make work, you have to have justification of why you really want it done. Because I'm guilty of this. I sometimes when I started my career, I would set up meetings and be like, oh, if I really thought this one through, this probably could have just been an email. Like, why right. the hell am I doing this? Right. And then making it easy for your employees actually to work on their products and get work done and manage your calendar. So I think it's beautiful. Uh, let's go. I'm going to show the quick demo of Campfire because I think it's a really awesome product. Cool. And I want to talk about that. And I want to talk about your once philosophy, which I think is fantastic. So let me let me get to that. Give me, give me a second here. Sure. This is Campfire. It's a wonderfully simple and straightforward group chat tool. You install it on your own server. Let's go over how it works. Once it's set up, invite people to your account. Just click the gear, then share this link with them. Or click the QR code and have them snap a pic. If that QR code or link sneaks into the wrong hands, click the reset button to generate new ones, which invalidates the old ones. This is a list of everyone with access to your account. Remove someone here or click the crown to make them an admin. This sidebar shows all the chat rooms you have access to. Click one to enter. To create a new chat room, hit the plus and name the room. Everyone in the account automatically has access, but just turn that off to invite certain people. Right here are your DMs. Click here to ping one or more people. Over here is the name of the room you're currently in. Click the menu to rename it or change who has access. This is the notification setting for that room. You can get notified when anything happens, turn off notifications completely, hide the room from your sidebar, or only be notified when someone tags you. When you see a dark outline around a room or a dot underneath a ping, it means you have an unread message. Just click it to see what you missed. Click your profile pic to change your avatar or password. Or add a small bio that'll show up whenever someone clicks your avatar. Click these globes to see what each text box does in different languages. Below that is a list of chat rooms you have access to with the corresponding notification setting. I think this is really cool. Um, a couple questions. One, did you only have like two people working on this product? Because I think you have really small teams. And then uh, second thing is, can we talk about your once philosophy? And whatnot? Yeah. Um, this one had a few more people working on it because we had to build all the infrastructure necessary to uh, ship installable software and install it with a single command in the terminal. But future once products will be built by basically two people um, because all that infrastructure is now going to be shared. Um, across all the different ones products. Um, but yeah, uh, sm very small teams. Um, we'll work just start working on the next product this week, actually. Actually, last week we started, but this week we really, really can we started. Hear, can we hear about the new product? <sighs> I can't tell you about the new product. Sure. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, but I, I can tell you that like we expect it probably to be done in 12 weeks is what we're hoping. So two site, we, we, we have these things called six week cycles. We work in six week cycles. We're thinking it's about a two cycle product uh, and there'll be two, maybe, maybe ultimately three people. Plus me, I'll be jumping in or Dave will be jumping in a little bit. Um, the philosophy around once is, so once is once.com, O-N-C-E.com. Um, it's a shift back to uh, what we're calling kind of the stone age, which was when you actually bought software, paid for it once, installed it on your own computer or server, and you were done. Um, instead of today, SaaS, which is SaaS software, of course, which we, we sell, Basecamp and Hay or SaaS, We'll continue them as SaaS. We might make other SaaS products in the future, but these are subscription services, right? Which is what everyone's used to today. You basically can't buy software today for a business without paying for it in perpetuity. That feels wrong in a lot of cases. Uh, in some cases, it makes sense when things are truly services, but a lot of these products to keep paying month after month after month after month for essentially the same thing you had last month forever. And if you stop paying, you lose the whole damn thing. Like, I don't know. It doesn't feel so good. So we're trying to make a collection of a line of products that are radically simplified, basically generics of some of those popular product categories. And we're also going to in, introduce some brand new products that are, don't exist 
but along the same lines of really stripped down and simple that you'll pay for once. So, and, and you'll install on your own server and run on your own, your own computer, your own hardware. Um, it's and or, or a shared server like campfire is $299. Currently we might change the price down the road. Um, you download it, you get an email, you get a single line, open up a terminal on any server, paste it in basically and it's running. Okay. Um, and updates are automatically sent every two, every morning at 2 AM. If there's any, otherwise, like it's the same version you always had. Um, you can even run this on like DigitalOcean. You can run it on like a, a Raspberry Pi uh, and handle 250 users on a Raspberry Pi uh, on your own. And it's just amazing. Like this, it, it's a tight little small thing. And software used to be like this. What's even cooler though, is that you actually get all the source code as well. So not only do you get the product, you get the source code. You can see the code, you can audit the code, you can change the code, you can fork it, make it your own, whatever you want to do. This is kind of like a combination of open source and commercial software, but you only pay for it once. So it's a throwback to that way. It's also a throw forward in a lot of ways, we think, with some new ideas. So we'll see how it all shakes out. We only have one product out so far, Campfire. Sold a few hundred thousand dollars worth so far in a few months. So we're pretty happy about that start. And we'll see where it all goes. Dude, I, I'm, that's that's awesome. Uh, yeah. Joe actually from his Hawaiian island messaged me. <laughs> I think the once products hark back to an earlier time when software was purchased rather than rented. This yeah. approach uh, also allows customers to modify the software, which could lead to some complications when they want to upgrade. Perhaps Jason has thoughts on how that might work, possibly using some recent ML approaches to make such um, upgrades or mergers easy to handle at scale for a larger group of customers. Well, I've seen. So, if you're going to radically modify it you're just gonna go off on your own. And that's already a few people have purchased it and sort of use it as a starter kit essentially and really modified it considerably. So Daniel who runs a uh, small bets uh, community, I don't know if you know small bets. Um, What's small bets? Is it smallbets.co? Hang on, let me just see, I forget the actual, oh, smallbets.com. Um, check it out, you'll you'll see. It's, it's a really wonderful community of people. Basically he's encouraging people to make uh, small businesses that make a thousand bucks. Like just go make a thousand bucks. And he teaches people how to build small business, really, really small businesses that they can run on their own. And there's a community of other people doing the same thing. It's a really wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, so yeah, forget about starting a company. Just try making a thousand bucks with a small project. And it's, it's awesome. And he's got all these tutorials and live Q and A's and it's, it's a great community. Anyway, they used to be running on Slack. They're now running on Campfire as their, as their community system, but they forked it in a way where it's like very different now which is totally cool. So they're not merging in automatically any of our changes, but they can, they can look at our code and decide, you know, that feature that they added, it's actually pretty cool. We're going to merge that in manually. Um, so yes. you can, you can set it up in a way where you can do the mergers yourself if you want. Um, we also give you some ways, like if there's a bot API, so you can like pipe, pipe in your own stuff, your own way. Of course, you can also add custom CSS that's stored in the database. So even across new versions, it's not going to throw out your CSS changes. So, those will be maintained across versions. So, but it's not really built to be radically changed and then stay in line with our updates. Um, that's kind of how it's currently yeah, set up. Yeah, because then you'd be in workday hell. I hear at workday, like they have different customers of different versions and the engineers want to kill themselves. What a mess. They have, like yeah. I couldn't even, it's, it's terrible. Uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing is, of course, like when we sell this, you're on your own. I mean, the, the product will update itself automatically 2 a.m. every night, unless you want to turn that off. But, so you always get new updates from us uh, if there's anything that's new within the same version number and that's included. Um, but but um, so we're not we're not maintaining other people's installations. This is not a. I mean that would be a massive cost sink, very expensive for us. So this is like two ninety nine. You get it. We're done. We'll keep improving the product because we want to improve it for new customers too. And you're going to get the improvements. But we don't have this long term. Uh, there's no maintenance or service relationship here. It's like it's it's yours. And and that's the whole point of it. I love it. It's clean. I mean, yeah. I, I I worked at Slack. I love I love Stuart and and, sure. and everything. Great great dudes. Oh yeah. Uh, but Brilliant. I was doing my my side hustles, and it's you know eight twelve bucks a month. It it adds up when you're not bringing anything in. Hell yeah. And now everyone wants to be sass. Now kids, you watching back in the day? Me and Jason <laughs> used to go to these places called Fry's Electronics, <laughs> and you'd walk down the aisles, and there'd be a box. It's got a CD-ROM in it, and you buy it, and you pop it in, and then you don't have to pay anymore. Amazing. But then someone was like, hey, no, we're going to do lifetime subscriptions. The product <laughs> will never change, and we'll keep on milking. Yeah. So it's good that you're doing this. Small businesses appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. Um, and look, it's an alternative. I'm yeah. not suggesting SaaS is dead. or it, 
but 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 can there you, should can you be. actually can you actually say that so i can quote you on that and get some clickbait i'd really that, appreciate that that it is dead or is <laughs> yeah, not dead yeah, you... just say it's dead so i can get clickbait sass is dead <laughs> no. so uh, so i think i think like there's gonna be there should be alternatives some things should be services hey for example our email service uh, running your own mail server is a totally different thing than running a chat server a mail server needs to connect with the whole world You've got deliverability issues. You've got spam. This is actually a service. It's an infrastructure. It's very complicated to run. You don't want to run your own. You could, if you're a super uber mega nerd, you could do it. But most people do not want to run their own email server. So that makes sense as a service, right? But other things are going to make sense as a product. And there should be products. There should be services. And you should have a choice. So that's where we're headed. We'll that's see what happens. I don't know if the markets, we might be 10 years early. Speaking of, you know, we were talking about early, like before. We might be way early on this. We might be way late on this. This might be, there might be no demand for this ultimately in the end. We don't know, but we're going to make a few of these products for sure and see what ends up happening. And we'll figure it out from there. You're doing the experiment. And I, yeah. I appreciate that. You see like small companies like Google, when it was super small, they put things out in experiment. And then right. when it's to get large, it's like, no, we need a 15 person committee that spends 17 years to do something. <laughs> and then we wait, embarrass ourselves and lose open AI. Horrible. Okay. So we unfortunately have 10 minutes. And I wish I could have you for five hours because this is great. You and me are both closet hippies. So back at Santa Clara University, I had my mentor who was like one of the first black directors at IBM. He said, Jordan, I was in a lot of terrible meetings and I taught myself how to meditate with my eyes open. <laughs> and I was like, oh, <laughs> thank you. And so you, uh, I for randomly on YouTube, Alan Watts videos show up. And every oh, yeah. time I watch them, I'm just like, it like clears my mind just listening to what he has to say. So you have a quote that says, from Alan Watts, Philosophy and Timeless Wisdom, uh, problem, this is from Twitter, problems that remain persistently insoluble should always be suspected as questions asked in the wrong way. And that's from Alan Watts. I'd love to hear what, like, how you saw that, what, what, what that meant to you. It seems like every Alan Watts quote I see, I love. So like, it's, I don't want to become like a groupie. Uh, but actually, one of the things I would recommend, um, so Sam Harris' uh, Waking Up app, um, I think they bought the rights or something to the entire Alan Watts uh, library of, of, of talks. So there's dozens and dozens, I believe, of hours of Alan Watts talks. So I've been like slowly making my way through those. Uh, and every, every, whenever I listen to him, it's just, there's a real clarity. And I love that quote in particular, because I think a lot of the stuff is about the questions you asked initially. And that's kind of, uh, th that's what really caught me with that quote. It, it's like, how do you, what kind of question are you going to be asking about this? If you ask the wrong question, you know, you can get stuck pretty easily trying to either solve the wrong thing or not be able to figure something out. But if you ask a different question. You, the, the solution might be right in front of you. So I just think it's important to start at the question and not battle so much about the answer initially. Like what question are we actually asking? Which is sort of something I was getting to earlier, which is like, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Which was the IPO thing. Like, why, why are we doing this? Oh God, we were asking ourselves the wrong questions. Like, do we want to do this? No. Qu answered. Like the, the answer was, we don't want to do this anymore. Like that, that's, that solved 50 other that answered 50 other answers, basically, or questions or um, instantly by just getting back to the feeling. And, and the thing that's really important to us is actually intuition, which gets a little bit more into Alan Watts as well. Like we are an, a gut driven company that values intuition over pretty much everything else. Uh, we look at data in some areas of the business in terms of like hardware and software performance, like speed and that and uptime and that kind of stuff, where there's like sort of definitely scientific measurements here. But in terms of deciding what to do with a product or how people feel about it or what we should be doing next, it's a feeling. It's a gut feel. We go in a direction, we try something out, we do it. We go in another direction, we try something out, we do it. I'm not, again, I'm not looking backwards, measuring whether or not something worked or not. People are like, how do you know it worked? I don't really know if it worked or not, but collectively things are working. Things are working. Look, the numbers are panning out. Things are working. Enough things are working. I don't need to figure out if it's these 18 things or these 17 things or these 22 things. In general, enough is working. Let's just keep working that way. So that's kind of how we how we approach things. I love it because you have a holistic vision of like, generally, do we feel successful? Whereas generally. product managers and large companies are like, oh, these little features work here and here. We're doing good. But then the user externally is like, Google just launched Gemini Pro Ultra, Nest Hub Max, Microsoft 360, <laughs> XPAC, Essentials One. What the hell is this? Yeah. <laughs> what is yeah. this experience? What's going on here? You know? Yes. So I, I love that. Um, 
let's give uh, also people say like there's no such thing as uh, bad questions. There's only such thing as bad answers. Like, no, there is bad questions. Bad I've questions. had good pro- <laughs> I've seen good projects by small teams organized, and the VP will come in and just start asking these bad questions, and then all of a sudden management teams run in, and now that team that was successful has 50 managers in there, and it's dead. So yeah. think twice about your question. It's best to leave good alone. Just leave it as it is. Yeah. Um, here's another one, Alan Watts. Mm-hmm. Muddy water is best cleared by leaving it alone. Yes. Oh, fucking love that one. So good. I mean, it, the thing I love about that quote is is it's it's um, in some ways it's not intuitive. This is that people fiddle with things that are broken too much. And they keep breaking it deeper and deeper and deeper and they fiddle and they fiddle and they fiddle and they add more policies and they add more stuff and they make it more complicated and the whole Google thing. Google chat, Google chat, go ahead. Google chat. And they think at some, at some point, like if they just fiddle a little bit more, it's going to be better. But, but then if you think about like, again, muddy water, like how do you get mud out of water? I mean, you could use highly sophisticated filters and sieves and a, and a, a big process. I'm sure there's probably some way to use a centrifuge and the whole, or you can just like let it sit and the silt goes down to the bottom automatically. So just leave, some things are just better left alone um, and don't mess with them too much. And that includes like even the way you run a business, like don't mess with it too much. Um, don't make it complicated. Uh, and if things are getting out of control, sometimes the best thing is just to stop for a minute and let things settle down versus trying to manipulate them into settling down. Just let things sort of reset. I think that's the natural way. Things tend to come back to the middle at some point. So um, that's what that means to me. It's a great quote. So good. And yeah. I think also you'll find uh, leaders or VPs thinking like they have to be involved in everything or they hear, they hear squawking. And it's like, let the squawk out. Let people squawk. Don't react to it because the reaction is like a, a, a black folklore, bear, rabbit, and tar baby. Each time you put the hand in there, it gets stuck. Another hand gets stuck. And before you know it, you're dead. Now, Cool. I think that, by the way, the, the management meddling is a great example of um, playing too much and, and, and micromanaging and getting too much involved. And, and this is something I've had to learn over the years, which is just to st- stand back and let thing, let some, a lot of things happen. Just let things, even if it wouldn't happen the way you wished it would happen or you wanted it to happen a certain way and it didn't happen, though, there's a penalty, there's a cost to over meddling and being in there. And maybe you get it just right in your mind, but like what damage have you done? You've taken away people's agency. Now people think you're always going to swoop in and change things on them at the last minute. Like it's best just to let some things just be, let them be, let them go. It's fine. And, and you're actually going to bring a lot more harmony to the organization. Now, this isn't, doesn't mean like you want to be, you want to trend towards mediocrity or you want to let really bad things go. That's not what I'm saying. I am saying, you know, that people have to develop their own talents here and you've got to stand, stand back. And a lot of things can just go out just fine. They're going to be just fine. And you're going to get a lot of benefits from things that go out that way versus you having to come in at the last minute and just tweak it a little bit. Like, don't feel like you got to like salt everything. Don't just let people do it. So anyway, it's another I version hate, of that. I hate helicopter parents and I hate yeah. helicopter managers. That's what uh, it is. Okay. So we only have three more minutes. Yeah. We got to ask you about RTO. You're the original gangster back in 2000, early 2000s doing art. Uh, sorry. Work from home. 1999, and, please. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> game recognizes game. I, you know, right, right. And so I was going to say is uh, when I was doing acquisitions for Google, I was always acquiring companies in like the Midwest, the East Coast. They're all distributed. And they would say, like, hi, welcome to Google. No, come to Mountain View because some VP douchebag says you need to right. be there. And now your lives are going to be ruined. And then we're going to deprecate you and you'll hate yourself. Yeah. So when you were watching this whole RTO return to office debate and work from home and shit, like what were you thinking? Were you like Michael Jackson eating popcorn and just like laughing and smiling <laughs> or what? I, mean. yeah. I, you know, frankly, like I, I think everyone covers got to make up their own mind. And like I don't really care what other people do. It, it, like, if you want to bring everyone back and you think it's worth it, go ahead. Uh, we're not going to do that. We're, we're going to be, we're fully remote. We always will be. And that's how we're going to run our business. But um, I think the remote work is sort of, can be, it can be a scapegoat for some, like we're not doing well. So we need to bring everyone back to the office as if that's going to make everyone do well. It, it often isn't. It's also a way to lay people off, of course, but I'm not going to be totally cynical. Some, t- some organizations are better off being together. That's just how their culture is built. That's what they're there for. That's how they've always been. And that's fine. It is fine. It's just, you know, it's, it's not our style, not our approach. But um, I mean, who, who am I? I? I run a company of 70 people. Like, I, who am I to tell Google or Apple or Tesla or whatever the hell what they should be doing? It's ridiculous. It truly is. So 
whatever. Um, they should do what, what works for them. Um, but I do think what's nice is that remote has been has been seen and proven as a viable option that prior to COVID was not even considered even a possibility. So I'm glad that people had the experience and I hope that many people stay that way. But again, it makes sense or whatever makes sense for whatever company you're working at is what it's going to be. So true. Different strokes for different folks. That's right. And I find work that's grindy, that requires cracking the web, like eye banking, like you need these associates in the office so they can be on those spreadsheets so the VP can w crack the web, not something you should do that. Yeah. At, at Google, it felt like we were working off of five-year plans where everyone knew what we were going to do for us the year. And it was just like, you just wait for the gear to come to you and then you do your gear and then you go back to work. And so, uh, no, I, I definitely agree with what you sa were saying. Um, I had another thought and I can actually... Anything that you want to talk about that you haven't talked about yet so far? Anything I have a lot to talk. I, this is fun okay. chatting. I have to go, though, because I've got uh, something else in one minute. Okay. So I do have to go. Can we have you but back I'd love again, to do it again down the road? Yeah. Hell let's yeah. Do, let's do a part two. Okay. Yeah. Jason, thank you so much. Continue doing what you're doing. We need you. We need your voice out there. You're doing good work. You're you're the epitome of what it is of being a good business leader, and I appreciate you. And a lot of people are watching, and they appreciate the work you're doing. So keep doing you, and uh, I will talk to you later. Thanks, right? Jordan. Very thank generous. You. I appreciate that. Thank Thanks you. for having me on. All right. Thanks. Bye.